think so. They're all here. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we might make a start since it's right at one o'clock. Um, my name's Edwin Tan, and um, on behalf of Senior Uni, I'd like to welcome you to today's session. Um, I'll be chairing um, this session, which um, consists of four short oral presentations. Co-chairing with me is Kenji Fujita. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to call our first speaker, Ayob Alamayeshu uh, Jebre Johannes, who is a third year PhD candidate and casual academic staff at the University of WA. He's also a research assistant at Telethon Kids Institute in Perth. Uh, prior to uh, commencing his PhD, Ayob worked as a researcher and a lecturer of clinical pharmacy at the University of Gondo in Ethiopia. Ayob has extensive experience in research and teaching. And today we'll be talking about the use of thromboprophylaxis guidelines and risk stratis stratification tools in atrial fibrillation. So thank you, Ayob. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Edin, for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Eyo. Uh, this is my wonderful research team, and the topic of my presentation is use of thromboprophylaxis guidelines and risk stratification tools uh, in atrial fibrillation. Uh, it's a survey of general practitioners in Australia. So to begin with, uh, atrial fibrillation is associated with uh, uh, five times increase in the risk of stroke and oral anticoagulants are uh, associated with a 70% reduction in this risk. Uh, there are clinical guidelines and they recommend oral anticoagulants in moderate to high risk of stroke uh, and the risk, risk stratifications exist for a stroke and breathing risk assessment. Uh, there is uh, oral uh, anticoagulant non prescribing in high risk patients in the Australian setting, uh, both in hospitalized patients as well as in uh, general practice setting, uh, more in the general practice setting. So, the aim of this study was to evaluate Australian GPs self reported use of clinical guidelines produced by cardiology societies and their use of risk stratification tools. So, this study was uh, conducted from May to November 2021 after obtaining ethics approval. And we used various uh, uh, recruit, recruitment uh, strategies, mainly social media platforms and through uh, uh, RACGP. Uh, and we used the online platform Qualtrics to conduct the survey uh, using a survey tool, which contains three sections, the social demographic information, uh, GP self-reported use of uh, clinical practice guidelines and risk stratification tools and uh, weights ascribed to different factors in their decision-making process. And we did descriptive statistics and the chi-square test uh, using SAS. Uh, so, <laughs> so, Coming to the results, uh, a total of 134 responses were recorded. Uh, after excluding 19 responses for various reasons, there were a total of 115 responses, which were from uh, all states and territories of Australia. Uh, the age distribution of the participants were representative of the GP's workforce in Australia, but there were more females uh, than males uh, when compared to the GP's workforce. Uh, in terms of uh, the source of information used by GPs, uh, only a small proportion of GPs uh, ac uh, access thromboprophylaxis related information directly from the guidelines. Uh, a, a large majority of uh, the participants reported using alternative sources of information. They reported various reasons for not using the guidelines, including the presence of uh, too many guidelines for atrial fibrillation and for various disease conditions and the very long and time consuming nature of the guidelines. Uh, the guidelines sometimes dis disagree with each other as well as uh, with the previous uh, criteria. In terms of uh, assessing risk of stroke, most of them uh, reported to mainly rely on uh, risk stratification tools, but uh, 
a third of the participants mainly relied on clinical judgment as opposed to the use of risk stratification tools. Uh, a similar observation was also uh, made uh, in terms of assessing the risk of bleeding. Uh, almost half of the participants reported of using risk stratification tools to assess bleeding risk, but uh, the rest were primarily relying on their uh, clinical judgment. And there was an association between using a formal bleeding risk assessment tool and formal bleeding uh, uh, stroke risk assessment tools. In terms of their preferred risk assessment tools, uh, most relied on the charts to VASC score and the Hasblade scores for assessing their stroke and bleeding risk respectively. And the re most of this was done only when initiating uh, new oral anticoagulants, but not consistently afterwards. So this study has some limitations, uh, mainly considering the large GP workforce, there's uh, our sample size was uh, relatively smaller. And because we conducted online survey, uh, it was not possible to calculate uh, the response rate. In conclusion, most respondents access thromboprophylaxis related information in atrial fibrillation uh, from sources other than clinical guidelines, and uh, therefore strategies are required to address the lack of usability of uh, current guidelines. And risk assessments were typically used on uh, oral anticoagulant initiation only. And this paper was uh, published in Journal of Evaluation and Clinical Practice, if you are interested to uh, read more about this research work. And I would like to thank the University of Western Australia for supporting my studies and uh, Professor Luke for his guidance during the initial stages of uh, my project. And thank you. Do you have any questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, you can come here and speak a bit loud. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I really enjoyed that. I just wondered, how did you recruit GPs to answer your questionnaire? Uh, thank you. A bit of a nightmare. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so what we... Sorry. So what we tried is to try to engage as many uh, participants by the first thing we did is talk to the RAC GP and other uh, GP related associations, and which also tried to talk to uh, those CPD websites where GPs normally uh, visit. And we tried to use uh, uh, social media platforms like Twitter, uh, LinkedIn and other uh, social media platforms. Also, we try to engage people, GPs who are active in social media so that they try to tweet, uh, share and with their colleagues. And uh, we also use newsletters that are read by GPs, but not sure if that had a, a significant impact in the recruitment. So mainly we relied on RACGP and social media platforms. Thank you. Yeah, there's no microphone for the room, there's a microphone for the room. So if the speakers can raise their voice oh, and any questions or uh, speakers can they use the microphone there. That way the people on Zoom can hear. Mm -hmm. And then as the speakers can just project to allow everyone in the room to hear. Thank you. Eyob, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, did you have any associ any association between the people? <laughs> did you see <laughs> any association between the the, the different um, age groups and uh, uh, GPs out of training? who were more likely to use the clinical guidelines? Was there any association that you saw between that at all? Or did you investigate that? Might be in your paper. Yeah. Uh, so we, we tried to investigate if there is any association, but we didn't find any, mainly because of the uh, sample size. It's only 115. So we didn't find any significant association. So the only statistically significant association we found was GPs who use uh, risk stratification tools for stroke 
are more likely to use risk stratification tools for leading. So that, that's the only statistical significant association. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so I'd like to invite our next speaker, Alex Burke, to come up. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, Alex Burke is a Vero Jury Medal and currently a PhD student looking into curriculum development around cultural safety, competence, and pharmacy. And he'll be talking about clinical yarning with Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander peoples. So thank you, Alex. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right, thank you, Edwin. And thank you all for coming to my TED talk. So it's really nice. Yeah, so I'm Alex. And yeah, so my presentation today is on clinical yarning for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, a systematic review of its use and impact. Just before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation, whose lands on which we are today. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge any Aboriginal people who are in the room and also our elders past, present and emerging. Also, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that they're the oldest continuous culture in the world and that they've been on this land for, for for millennia, and also that they're still going strong to this day. In saying that, however, uh, they are facing some health disparities. So uh, their life expectancy is about 10 years less than uh, the regular Australian. Uh, they're four times more likely to have diabetes and they're two times more likely to have a heart attack as well. Uh, so looking into that, so are they looking at ways that we could possibly uh, reduce those uh, those health barriers is uh, one way we possibly is clinical yarning. So what is clinical yarning? So it's a culturally competent form of communi communication between healthcare professionals and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. And it's made up of three separate but interconnected uh, yarning. So it's social yarning, which is where you try and form a connection with the person you're talking to. A diagnostic yarn, which is where you're trying to uh, find out what's wrong with the person, what medical condition they have. And the management yarn is where, so you're trying to treat the condition, but you're trying to link it back to stories that they might uh, uh, acknowledge or that they might actually know about. So it makes it easy for them to understand. So the aim of my study was to see if, to determine if adopting a clinical yarning framework can improve the health outcomes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. So the method was, so yarning was a key search term. We put it into seven databases as seen here. And then what we did, we ended up with 375 papers and then we whittled that down to only five, unfortunately. So now many people have been, there's not much research being done in this area. And so, and also we looked at how the yarning was used, uh, who performed it. So if it was an Aboriginal person or a non-Indigenous person, what, who was it used on? So it was a, a patient, was it an organization? Uh, what were the measured outcomes? So was it a physiological outcome and how was it measured? So was it, it so was it uh, again, a physiological outcome or was it a change in policy? And so from the results, so that two out of the five papers, so the outcome measure was self-reported knowledge. And one of the papers saw a change in policy, and in this case was in regards to smoking. One out of the five papers had self-reported decrease in smoking and alcohol use. And also one of the five papers saw a change in cardiovascular risk parameters. So four other five studies also looked at self-reported perceptions via qualitative means on all surveys. And so, and one of the five papers actually measured physiological changes pre and post. And that study itself, so there were 28 participants in it. And so it went over eight weeks and looked at after eight weeks, uh, they found that there was significant reduction in BMI, blood pressure and waist girth. It should be noticed, however, that this was actually in conjunction with the regular normal exercises. But they also found that with the, uh, the yarning group, they actually found that more people were actually coming to the sessions and people who weren't in the original one had more people actually coming to it. So they actually found that afterwards they had more people actually attending. So uh, as noticed, so there weren't many papers in this analysis due to just the, the, the dearth of literature and also the quality of them was rated from moderate to low. And so it's not enough papers to make a conclusive yes, no statement as of yet. And so and more research and studies need to be conducted in this area as well. But it does be able, uh, but yarning does seem to be able to break down wars and actually improve communication between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and healthcare practitioners. So in conclusion, so more research needs to be done to conclusively say that clinical yarning does actually improve health outcomes, but it does look like maybe the way future healthcare should actually be uh, conducted with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. And it's also put on that Aboriginal health, cultural competence and cultural safe ways of communicating is actually ingrained in Australian health curricula. So 
Uh, so I'd like to thank the co-authors of my paper. So Rebecca Moll, Susan Welch, Susan Welch, Tamara Power, Sherry Lucas. And if you're interested at the QR code, hopefully it works to the actual paper as well. So yeah. Any questions? Yes. Oh, you have to come up. All oh, right. Oh, thanks very much. Um, look, I'm I'm curious. Uh, you use a very specific term. Is it like? Is it possible? Do you think that uh, what constitutes yarning has actually taken place in other settings? So yes. Yeah, so um, so yarning is a very specific term, but it's a very similar concept. Really. So they have in the United States of and in Canada as well, they have what's called term talking circles. Mm -hmm. So, and so it's very similar, but we kind of want to, we wanted to have a look more at the specific Australian focus as well. And also we were afraid that if we did film the yarning or, or talking circles, that it would kind of limit it. We've got, we wouldn't get, we get too many results at all. So, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, we get too little results. So we did yarning to try and draw in as much as we could. Wouldn't it be the reverse though? I mean, in my mind, you might have picked up things that constitute yarni that haven't actually been given that label. Um, so, in 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 a, in in a sense, you've restricted your uh, result, your True, findings. Yarni is also a very specific term. Yarni is also a very specific indigenous term, and we're looking specifically in regards to Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander people as well. So, yes. <laughs> I was just going to ask about the the, the clinical yarning itself. Mm -hmm. um, what what's happening now in clinical practice in the conversations that are being happening happening, and what should they look like? What's what what factors are actually missing yeah. from that conversation that's going on? Yeah, well, thank you. yeah. So the factors are missing. So I've, it's so from what it looks like at the moment, the things that are missing are the initial step of actually like building of like actual the con the connection first. So what happens is if you don't with uh, if you don't form the connection, you sometimes you shut down communication, and they're not as likely to be able to talk about what medical issues they have. And also the management area as well is where people aren't really focused. It's the fact that people aren't like try, aren't relating it to their like to the uh, Aboriginal person original backstory. So a very good example was um uh this so the study that looked at clinical yarning first was uh they looked at it for if you're talking about like um. Uh, what it's scabies so uh the thing with like itchiness if they talked about it's because the eggs are causing the itchiness so they so the person that they're talking to they were from the coast so they said so imagine when a turtle comes onto the coast lays its eggs they said and that's what happens in scabies is the laying of the eggs what causes the itchiness so it's that relation is what's called so it's a relation that makes it easy for people to understand and i don't and people aren't really doing that so it's real kind of a disconnect in regards to people aren't really understanding it that way any other questions? One more question? Yes. This is a real, really cool topic. I was just wondering whereabouts these clinical yarning circles took place. Was it in the Northern Territory? Or? So, uh, so they're all around Australia. So there was Victoria, I think there was one in New South Wales and Queensland as well. So yeah. Thank you. I'll now let's invite Dr. Natalie Gold to take the stage. And you had two talks. Yes. Cheers. I'll just introduce you. Um, so, oh. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, well, well, that's. <laughs> Um, well, that's being set up, I might just introduce uh, Natalie. So Dr. Natalie Gold is, an ex is experienced with widening access to medicines through community pharmacy. This has included many innovations and their evaluations, including vaccinations, trimethoprim for urinary tract infections and hepatitis C testing and treatment. Uh, she led the first in-world reclassification of sildenafil in New Zealand. Her research has included comparing different developed countries in reclassification of medicines from prescription to non-prescription, opening access through the pharmacist.
Um, so for this talk, she'll be talking about community pharmacists administering a blood product, a case study of routine prophylactic anti-D in pregnancy in South Auckland in New Zealand. So. Right. Okay, um, thank you for the opportunity to present on this. Um, we went looking for other models of pharmacy delivery of blood products and couldn't find any internationally. I'd be really interested to hear if there is um, community pharmacy doing that elsewhere. Um, so I thought it was useful to provide it as a case study today. Okay. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the fact that this work was led by Amanda Hanks, who's um, midwifery and um, innovation and maternal health. And I work with you from a pharmacy perspective. And we also had a number of others in the team um, from blood products areas and nursing. 15% um, of women are rhesus D negative. And if they get sensitized by a rhesus positive baby, which can happen if there's um, a, a crossover of blood, then um, that has really serious implications for a future pregnancy. That kind of, the implications can include things like intrauterine um, transfusions, which are very expensive and a bit scary. So traditionally, anti-D has been given um, at time of birth and time of miscarriage or termination or at a time of a bleed for rhesus negative women. Um, and what they've worked out is that some sensitization can happen from micro bleeds that are not detectable. So they've worked out that if you give anti-D routinely to all rhesus negative women at a couple of points late in pregnancy, that it um, can help reduce sensitization. Uh, and so um, they were going to roll this out in the area of Auckland where I was working. Um, and this area is uh, 120 pharmacies, um, a population that includes a very high needs area as well as a more affluent population. Um, and we had to think about a model of how we could get it accessible to the, to the patient as accessible as possible while being able to be um, logistically able to happen because blood products aren't available through the wholesaler. So I wanted to describe um, the development of our model. We also had to bear in mind that with midwives having a caseload of about 40 to 50 women a year, they're not going to see a lot of people who are rhesus negative, particularly in some of our areas um, with populations such as Pacific, where it's very, it would be very uncommon to see it. Um, and so we wanted to work out how do we support them to prescribe it as well as possible. So this is our multidisciplinary team, which I talked about before. Um, that It was um, a real team effort because um, we didn't know a lot about the delivery of anti-D and the logistics around it um, as the, the midwife and, and myself as a pharmacist. Um, and we needed to understand how we best support this new initiative. So we had a lot of meetings and working out solutions and a lot of work that I've done before around implementing new pharmacy services was used to um, try and uh, make it as easy as possible to do it right. Uh, we developed protocols and we um, followed up afterwards with um, concerns arising. We had a number of issues that we had to think about that were quite different to other situations. We only had a fairly small number of women, about 300 in a year across our whole area, who would um, need the service. Uh, and we needed to think about how, um, how we deliver the medicine in a way that, um, that it supports the midwives' best practice when they wouldn't know a lot about what they're doing for a start um, because it was so new to them. And we had really specific dose time requirements. So it was used if you, you, you would have it at this week or this week, but if it's after 30 weeks, then they get both doses together. So we had to support midwives to um, prescribe it right, and we had to support the women to come in at the right time. Uh, we also had a need for a blood test prior to the first dose because you're looking for sensitization that's happened prior to the first anti-D. And we wanted that to be done less than 48 hours before that first dose. So we um, had to think about all of those factors. So what we did was we had um, an EOI for pharmacists that was really simple because pharmacy is very busy. So we got them to just fill out a survey, a monkey survey, took them five minutes. And from there, we could um, understand which ones were going to be the best for us. 
we selected um, just 12 pharmacies so that we could get a level of expertise in each of those pharmacies that would support best practice. We wanted them to, when they see a prescription from a midwife, know exactly what that prescription should be and be empowered to be able to go back to the midwife and give advice if necessary and ensure that the woman had had the blood test done before she came in and things like that. So quite different from usual, um, usual dispensing. And uh, it was IM injection, so we ensured that all the pharmacies um, who, uh, who got the service had um, vaccination qualified staff all the time that they were open. Um, and we also had a lot of support for pharmacies, so we wrote a standard operating procedure for them, we give, gave them training, and then we had a lot of blood service um, oversight with face-to-face -face meetings uh, with the pharmacies, visits to the pharmacies, and strong support and checks. Um, so although blood products are new to pharmacy, this model actually has worked uh, very well from a um, district health board perspective. We need to understand how it's worked from um, the women's perspective, the midwives and the pharmacists perspective, so there is some evaluation planned, but, um, but because of that multidisciplinary team and um, a lot of effort from a lot of people, we did um, think through a lot of the issues in advance and pharmacy really stepped up with it. Um, it was in the middle of a COVID, um, code red, we have um, lockdown, so it was a very significant lockdown and pharmacy still um, started delivering the service in that time, which was really impressive. Um, and I think without all the team members, we would have failed to get it right, but we, we actually did it, um, did it quite well and other, other regions are interested in following that now. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Um, question goes to uh, respect to past histories. Uh, are current blood products scheduled in New Zealand as pharmaceuticals? Because that would have an impact on the legislative framework that would enable for future this becoming a common service. Um, luckily for us, NTD is, re is registered as a prescription medicine in New Zealand, so that helped us. Oh. Um, in some states in Australia, that would be a barrier because there's legislation against pharmacists administering certain drugs unless they're specifically approved. If it wasn't uh, uh, scheduled as a drug, then there would be no legislative barrier against this pharmacist ever taking it. I can't really comment on how it works in Australia, but in New Zealand, I um, checked with all the appropriate stakeholders. And um, when I say checked with, um, I had very persuasive co um, conversations with all appropriate stakeholders. Um. Did they pay for it? How would it be paid for? So it's been funded. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, it has been funded um, through the Maternity Quality and Safety Governance Group. Um, they access some funding. It's one-off funding. However, if you think about um, sensitization and the potential costs that can be a million dollars for um, a single child um, that needs intrauterine transfusions, um, suddenly the small amount of payment that would cost us is not a great deal. The um, blood product itself is $186 per vial, so there's two vials given to each pregnant woman, um, and the cost of, um, of the pharmacy um, administration is $27, um, and they get the stock for free, they don't need to pay for it. Um, and so they're not, they haven't got any um, risk there at all. Sorry, Natalie, I'm not going to let you escape just yet. Um, so prenatal postnatal care is obviously multifaceted. And I was just wondering whether this was part of a more integrated pharmacy-led approach to perinatal care, or was this occurring in isolation and the other aspects of care were occurring elsewhere? 
Um, that's a really good point. Um, something that had been helpful before was that um, I was involved with a vaccination project in Waikato and we had pharmacists contacting midwives about the fact that they were providing pertussis vaccine in pregnancy. So we already had a bit of an understanding of how pharmacy and midwives could interact, which was very helpful for this. Um, and um, in terms of um, holistic um, viewpoint, we did certainly discuss um, the vaccinations in, um, in pregnancy as well as part of it. And, um, and we also wanted to reduce fragmentation. So we got a pharma code number for the product so that when the pharmacist got it put on their computer system, so that it would then go automatically onto test safe so that a doctor could see that this had been given on this date at this pharmacy. So we did try to think um, a little bit more about what the other providers needed and about what that woman needed for her pregnancy as well. Okay, and now I'd like to call on Andrew Bartlett for his presentation. This one, right? Oh, yeah, good one. You got the same images. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, Andrew Bartlett is a practicing pharmacist, academic, and PhD candidate. Andrew's area of research is preceptorship and training and assessment of preceptor competence. He'll be talking today about his talk entitled Towards Assessment of Pharmacy Preceptors, a Qualitative Study of Preceptor and Preceptee Perspectives. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, and I'd like to thank the organisers for the opportunity to talk on, on this topic. Um, so preceptorship is a really important part of uh, work integrated learning and the development of, of our students to become health professionals. And the, um, the influence that a pre preceptor has uh, is quite big in terms of how that student develops as a, as a professional. Um, so we... Um, really wanted to uh, focus today on one particular aspect of the, um, the recent research that we've been doing, one finding. So we did a literature review and identified 16 competencies of preceptorship um, in health professionals and mapped that to how they're assessed. Um, and then previous research has looked at um, the importance of having a consistent approach to preceptorship in the experience that students get. What we wanted to do was to look at um, how the assessment of competency of a preceptor's competency was viewed by um, both preceptors and preceptees. Um, so we aimed to, to conduct some focus groups um, that looked into this. Uh, we ended up with quite a good um, range of participants. We had 56 participants across 13 focus groups and three interviews. Um, so we employed a purpose of sampling strategy where we targeted um, both current students, interns, um, pharmacists from both hospital and um, community, as well as rural and regional settings and metro to get quite a broad cross-section. And we followed a semi-structured interview guide um, and transcribed all those interviews into in Vivo 12. Um, and then we took a constructivist approach to analysing the data where um, we acknowledged that uh, as participants, we're all co-creating that new knowledge. Um, and I also need to um, acknowledge uh, the part that I play as the, as the researcher, being a pharmacist and I've been a preceptor on, on a lot of occasions. And that all comes into account in the way that we are analysing the data. So the one um, particular theme that I wanted to discuss today was about employment versus education, which was one thing that came out in, the, in our um, interviews. Um, and it's illustrated quite well by this quote from one participant, um, where they're discussing other pharmacists being a lot easier to talk to. Uh, because they're not the ones who are going to be, you can make a mistake in front of them, because they're not the ones who are responsible for you having that job. 
um, which is quite a powerful statement. Um, and if you look at um, this dissonance in between the two elements of preceptorship being um, employment versus education, um, you can think of it in terms of this role theory where um, everybody who takes part in an organization has a role. It's either they've taken on or it's been assigned. Um, and there's different things that give us the cues to those roles that we learn through role modeling. Um, and a student is has been in, traditionally in the role of a student for their um, most of the last couple of years, and suddenly they're in an environment where it's different. So um, they're struggling with, I guess, that that distance between uh, the two different roles that they're experiencing now. Um, when I'm in a particular context, I take on a particular role. So for me, that's uh, if I'm in my academic mode, I'm dressed this way. If I'm in my pharmacist mode, I'm dressed in my white coat. And those sort of things trigger a change in mindset. So our behavior in an organization comes down to, to those roles that we think we're, we're being, um, we're, we're inhabiting. Um, so that can potentially cause some conflict. <laughs> And more and more, we're seeing the, the idea of entrustment in um, work integrated learning. So uh, this suggests a level of openness um, to develop this level of trust. So if I'm experiencing some sort of uh, ambiguity in the role that I'm experiencing or conflict uh, between that employer employee space, or in fact, even from a preceptor's point of view, I mean, I'm a preceptor, but I'm also an employer. Um, there can be some, some difficulties that arise there. And I think there's possibly some barriers to building that level of trust that comes with building and trusted and trustable um, aspects as well. So where does that leave us? Um, these are some questions that still need to be answered, I guess, is that do we need to have the separation of the employer-employee relationship from preceptorship? Um, so, and then also, um, in terms of the other pharmacists that was mentioned in that interview, um, do we need support for those other pharmacists to have dedicated precepting time that's possibly separated from the employment aspect? So um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope perhaps we can continue this conversation later and uh, might have some other thoughts on where this leaves us in that regard as well. Thanks for that. It would seem to me that the issue that was raised may be extremely different in a hospital internship than a community pharmacy. Yep. Can you unpack that for us a little bit? Is there something to learn from one relevant to the other? Yeah, definitely. Um, another another aspect that we looked at in that same those same focus groups was. Um, how people are comfortable with being assessed. And definitely those in a hospital environment are more accepting of things like peer assessment, for example, than community pharmacists. Um, so there is a difference There is a difference there. And often in um, the hospital environment, there is also um, some support for uh, an education pharmacist who is a dedicated preceptor. And it does again highlight one of the aspects of preceptorship at the moment and the idea that we tend to go into community or to um, hospital, and then where you, where you do that often dictates where you go in your career. Um, so there's there's a whole other aspect to that, and um, having um, a mixture of experiences in your preceptorship experience, I think, is a really important thing as well. Nice work, Andrew. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of interested in that sort of the, the tacit understanding of your role that you're talking about and uh, and what we can do about that, you know, is reflections enough, writing reflections enough, you know, that idea of, you know, you walk, you say you walk into a pharmacy and, and you observe what's around you and then you, then you start to act in a certain way or you respond in a certain way. Yeah. What, what can be done? How, how can we get value out of that or how can we prevent harm potentially? Uh, good question. Um, I think having a like reflecting on yourself as well, like uh, is important. Like I'm, I've come from that role of being a preceptor, 
and a pharmacy owner. And so now I'm an academic and I take the students and I get feedback from students on their experience that they've had. I guess that gives me a level of empathy for the, some of the issues that they're having. Um, and I guess that highlights for me the importance of role modeling and uh, the importance of role modeling. And if we can develop the idea of where we want our students to be um, and our professionals to be a lot earlier, hopefully that role modeling um, is something that's developing from a much earlier stage. Yes, I guess one thought would a, would a range of experiences help as yeah. opposed to a, a year true so that question for the is, is with a range of experiences help and yes I, I definitely think so there's a lot of um, support from pharmacists uh, and pharmacists both preceptors and preceptees that um, they would appreciate a range of experiences so they're they're looking at um, the way that different people operate and so they can do role model different behaviors and um, and different expertise and so yeah and in different contexts as well for the community, hospital, even in industry, or GP practices, or whatever. Yes. Yeah, just to follow up on that, what's the role then of the regulatory bodies uh, in terms of mandating uh, a, a variety of experiences uh, for an internship? I mean, at the moment, they have no, no position on this at all, but perhaps if things change, then that might encourage a change? Yeah. It might encourage a change. I think um, we can we can start small steps, I guess, from a from an, uh, an educational facility by um, offering when you know we're doing an integrated masters where the students are coming out with uh, their IT, their internship training program is completed when they when they've completed their degree, and as part of that, we can incorporate some of that variety of experience. And I guess that's one way we can start. Doing that, I think to mandate it is a big call, um, and might happen in time. Yes. Just tell you a little bit about what happens in the UK because it might be of interest. So in in Wales, it's it's still mandated, but they do four months in general practice, four months in community. Pharmacy and four months in hospital for their internship now, which is paid. Yeah. In Ireland, which isn't part of the UK, um, it's totally integrated into their five year degree, but the students went on strike when they weren't paid. <laughs> <laughs> so they did that. At Nottingham, <laughs> we actually have a five year integrated as well as the other model yeah. where they don't get paid, and that's worked incredibly well. But the regular way to Regulator went to doctor it and they've just decided that we're going to have the one year at the end rather than an integrated. Okay. Um, we wanted it to be in two six month periods, but they haven't gone for it, unfortunately. Yeah. But a lot of the posts are now split, so it's very much not about an extra pair of hands, but about the training. Yeah. But I still do preceptors need far more training, so you're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so preceptor training, I guess, to uh, once you've been able to assess them on some sort of standard, you can then um, identify gaps of need training. Thank you to all our speakers in that session. It was uh, very exciting to hear all the uh, latest findings. So um, we'll take a short break and then we'll start the next session shortly. So thank you all. Do you want to put up your... Um, what's that it? Yeah. Uh, what am I doing first? Long space. Yeah. 
Get out of there. Get out of there. All right. So that's where you find it. All right. I think. No, not this session. So I feel like you relax. Get out of here. You barely done anything. Oh, yeah. Just sharing. Yeah, yeah, just sharing a bit and um, yeah. Oh, I've gone back to being student. This is my part of my thing. Yeah, why not? Are you are you doing it at night? Here's your student. Well, Carl is the one who described oh, yeah. I think there's nothing about the topic. <laughs> nothing in my show. Yeah. Uh, then I've got Shane Scarhill from Portland. Okay, great. And Shane Jackson, because it's all about policy. Yeah. Shane yeah. Jackson is really good integrating into the world. Especially in Australia. Shane Scarhill is a bit about it. I didn't know what it was. Yeah, yeah. Did you start this? Uh, that's oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. It's like very easy. Yeah, that's the thing. Just want to get it done. Better? How about you? Just in the room. Better? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I remember. Sure. How are you today? Can you hear that? <laughs> Not really. It's fine when I get the full camera. What about like this? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Maybe that's the basic. Now, yeah, I think that's the other. 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 Yeah, I think the Yeah, Yeah, the we're finished with this session. We're finished with this session.